بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين All praise and thanks belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and may the peace and blessing of Allah be upon his servant and final messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as to what follows my dear respected brothers in Islam Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and last week we, we discussed قوله تعالى وقوله تعالى قلوب يوم إذ واجفة أبصارها خاشعة and we said that sometimes Allah subhanahu wa taala He depicts the terror of that day right by mentioning events that are going to occur on that day so He will speak about the sun and what will happen to the sun about the moon and what will happen to the moon about the stars and how they'll drop from where they are, about the sky and how it'll tear up, about the earth and what will happen with the earth, and the mountains, what will happen with the mountains. And if that's not scary enough, then there's another style in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses, and that is by depicting the terror that's on the faces of the people that see what's happening. So he says, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَاجِفَةٌ if all the signs and these great events that are going to occur on that day didn't uh, terrify you, then let me tell you about your reaction, how it will be. So Allah says, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَاجِفَةٌ قُلُوبٌ Some hearts. Because if it was al qulub, if it was the Al which is the definite article, it would have meant all the hearts. Rather Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلُوبٌ that's called the nakira, which is the indefinite article. And simply what that means is that it's referring to a group. So when you say some hearts, you're already given the idea of there are other hearts that don't have this wajaf, this fi in them. That's qulubun. And the tanween that comes on the bat at the end, the two dhamma, it indicates and refers to something that's great. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us that this group, some of them, but they're many in number. A lot of these people, their hearts, yawma even, especially on that day. Why is it important to say especially? Because maybe today there's no fee. And that's the case. The disbeliever has no fee today. But especially on that day, there will be fee. Yawma even wa jifa. And we said wa jifa is a type of fee that is used for an animal. So you, you slap the animal. The Arab, he used to say, وَجَفْتُ الْخَيْلِ He'd slap the, the horse or the camel, so on. And he'd run away out of fear, out of uh, terror. And so that is al-wajaf. So Allah Azza wa Jal, in other words, when he uses this word, he's humiliating the disbelievers. He's saying they're going to have the fear of an animal. قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَاجِفَةٌ and another thing we shared with Wajifa, we said that it's a ismiya, it's a noun, and it refers to something that's consistent. And we gave the example of, you know, if you fee something now, your heart may, may be pounding, you might fee, but as time goes by, your heart settles, goes back to its normal rhythm. But Wajifa, because it's a noun, it, it's indicating to something consistent. So what Allah Azza wa is saying, that the heart, is pounding out of fee so much so that it doesn't rest. It's wajifa, it's consistent. It keeps going forever after seeing the terrors of that day. قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ وَاجِفَ أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعَةً Allah says that the visions, not أَبْصَارُهُمْ, their vision, their eye, أَبْصَارُهَا meaning the vision of the heart. And so this, this was a profound lesson that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches. And that is that whatever you see is affected by what's in your heart. We said this, right? If there was iman in the heart, then what you see should serve as a reminder for you. You see the mountains, you see the earth, you see uh, the creation of Allah azza wa jal. If there is iman in here, then what you see here should only increase what's in here, should serve as a reminder. But if there's nothing here, then no matter what you see, it won't give any benefit. It won't serve as a reminder for you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that the people on the day of judgment, 
the disbelievers, he says, Absaruha Khashia, their vision, their sight is Khashia. And Khashia means it's overwhelmed with fear, it's in extreme fear. That's Khashia. You know, Khushu' is the feeling, you know, when you're so, so afraid that your muscles become numb and your bones become weak. That's Khushu'. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that the disbelievers eye will have khushu'. Why? Didn't we say the, the, the vision and the heart is connected? Now that his heart is pounding, it's racing. Now there's iman in the heart. He's got iman, he's seen what's happening. Now it's translated. Now what he's seeing in his eye, it's affecting his heart now. But it doesn't benefit him now. Because the, the time, the dawr taklif is finished. Where you have to worship Allah is here. Over there it doesn't bother, it doesn't, doesn't count. So, قُلُوبٌ يَوْمَ إِذٍ أَبْصَارُهَا خَاشِعًا They did not feel the fee here. They will feel the fee on that day. And why is their heart pounding and racing? And why are their eyes overwhelmed with fee? This is our discussion. We'll continue inshaAllah ta'ala today. Why is it so? Because in this life, they used to say, and that's the verse that comes after, يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَةِ They used to say, and consistently say, يَقُولُونَ is a present tense, which already indicates to something that's frequently coming out of their mouth. Just like, عَمَّ يَتَسَاءَلُونَ It's the same concept here. What is this thing that they're arguing about? What do they talk about? The same thing is present in this surah. يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَةِ they would say, they would continually say, is it the case that we are going to be returned back to where we started, back to life? You know, in the Arabs, this is an expression. You say, Fulanun raja'a fi hafirati. It means he went back or he came back to where he started. That's raja'a fi hafirati. So in other words, what they're saying is that, يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا certainly. Is this, this the case? That we are going to be returned back to where we started from? We, we were given life, then we died, we're going to be given life back again? And there's something interesting in the word, la mardudun. Mardudun comes from the word radda, which means to send back something. But it implies another meaning. And that is something that's rejected and sent back. Something that's rejected and sent back. So for example, you know, you go to the, to the borders or wherever, you come to a country, you have your visa work and your passport and so on, and they don't accept your visa work and, and you're rejected, you're sent back. Your paperwork is disqualified and you're sent back. That's radda. So in other words, look at this. It is actually indicating that sarcastically, this is how they used to make fun of the hereafter. They'd say... Oh, are we going to be rejected and sent back like our death wasn't good enough? What is this? This is in a sarcastic way. That's what the word mardudun implies. It implies that they're saying what our death wasn't good enough, that now we're going to be rejected, now go back to life and die properly again. So they'd make poke fun at the idea of Yawm al Qiyamah through this word, Lamardudunah fil hafira. Now this seems really impossible for the disbeliever. But if it might seem possible for him, if we're speaking about, I just die right now, or if, I'm, if I die right now, my body is all intact, nothing's disappeared, nothing's missing. The only factor or the only thing that's missing is the soul, or probably I'm not breathing. Maybe, probably it's possible that I come back to life if you were to give me life after a few hours, yeah, I'd probably believe that. But you're talking about a time, أَإِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا نَخِرًا You're talking about a time, O Prophet ﷺ, this is their argument, because يَقُولُونَ It's from their speech. They're saying, you're speaking about a time, أَإِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا نَخِرًا When we become crumbled and decayed bone. You know, نَخِرًا عِظَامًا means bones. Nakhira is when the bone decays, when it becomes empty from the inside, that bone marrow, all of it is eaten and it's all 
gone rid of, it's gone away. It becomes just an empty bone that's become like a shell that when the air passes through it, the other side brings out a foul smell, a very dirty smell, an ugly smell. That's nakhira. أَإِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا nakhira. You're speaking about a time that we don't even exist. Maybe we'll believe you if you said that, all right, you're going to be brought back to life a few minutes or a few hours after we die. Maybe because we're still intact. But you're speaking about a time after we're gone, long, long gone. And we've become reduced to nothing but soil. That's all you've become at the end. وَهِيَ ramim. It's so it's crumbled. There's nothing left except a backbone. The ending of the backbone, the tailbone. أَإِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا نَخِرَةً قَالُوا تِلْكَ إِذًا كَرَّةٌ خَاسِرَةٌ Now قَالُوا This is a past tense. And past tense refers to something that's what? Something that doesn't happen consistently and frequently. Something that's very minimal. Something rare. It comes out once a time. You know? And I'll just share with you that example again so you can uh, be familiar with this uh, rule and principle. You know, just like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran in Surah An-Nisa, He speaks about uh, homicide and manslaughter. Intentional murder, to kill someone intentionally, and to kill someone by accident. Look how Allah mentions it. When He speaks about the intentional killing, which is the homicide, He says, وَمَنْ يَقْتُ الْمُؤْمِنَ مُتَعَمِّدًا He uses the present tense for something that's, that for the killing that's intentional. Because if you kill intentionally, then obviously you're probably more like, most likely going to kill again. So the present tense is used that refers to something that's consistent. But when Allah speaks about an accidental killing, which is, for example, manslaughter, then He uses the past tense. وَمَنْ قَتَلَ مُؤْمِنًا Because if you accidentally kill someone, then it's not likely that you're going to kill someone again by accident. So the past is used. In other words, this is just to clarify the idea of present tense refers to something that's continuous, continuity. And a past tense refers to something that's minimal, something that doesn't happen that often, less often. That's what the past tense is. So here, يَقُولُونَ أَإِنَّا لَمَرْدُودُونَ فِي الْحَافِرَةِ Consistently they're in argument and they always speak about this. What are we going to come back to life? أَإِذَا كُنَّا عِظَامًا نَقِرَةِ قَالُوا And this قَالُوا indicates that they used to say this statement that I'll share with you, but they used to say it less often. And what is this statement? قَالُوا it's illustrating that the disbelievers sometimes they gave actual thought to the day of judgment. They said, if, if there is a slight possibility that what you're saying is true and we're going to come back from the dead, tilka idan karratun khasira. Verily, certainly, no doubt about it, this is going to be a return. A karra, karra means return. That is full of loss. Khasira. That is full of loss. And karra also in the Arabic language means to attack. You know, so like they had the idea of uh, a military strategy. And that was karra wa farra. Means he attacks and he runs away. Attack and run away. So, tilka idhan karratun khasira would mean that they would say, if indeed what he was talking is correct and it's right and we're going to come back and be revived then surely it is going to be an attack against us that's going to cause us a lot of damage this is qalu tilka idhan karratun khasira so allah azza wa jal ends their conversation and he says fa inma hiya zajratun wahida you know in the previous surah when their mouth were running when their mouths were running against the day of judgment and they're saying, uh, Allah cut the discussion and he ended it by saying, Kalla sayalamun, kalla, stop. Here, their mouth is running. 
يقولون إنا لمردودون في الحافرة أإذا كنا عظاما نخرة قالوا تلك إذا كرة خاسرة Allah cuts the discussion He says فإنما هي زجرة واحدة Stop All it is All it's going to take Is one yell One loud scream فإنما هي زجرة أي زجرة Is a yelling Is a yelling sound A very loud sound That comes out of the mouth And this zajrah is referring to the second blow of breath in the trumpet. When the angel blows in it, that's all it takes for you to be revived. Nothing more than this. And you know, just before this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ تَتْبَعُهَا الرَّادِفَةِ And we said, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الرَّاجِفَةِ When the shaker will shake, الرَّاجِفَةِ was referring to what? To the earth and the mountains. يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالِ But Allah called this earth with the mountains الرَّاجِفَة The shaker Giving us the idea that that's its destiny It will shake So يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْرَّاجِفَة Actually referred to the first blow of the trumpet When the first breath is blown in the trumpet We all know at that time Is when النَّازِعَاتِ غَرْقَ Happens the most When a lot of نَزَعَ happens Is at the first blow of the trumpet and that's when all the disbelievers are on land. There's no more believers. That was referring to the first blow. That Bauhar Radifa referred to the second blow in the trumpet when everyone gets up from their grave. And between the two blows, between the two trumpets, between the two blows, there is 40. How many 40 years, 40 months, 40 days? Allahu Alam, the Prophet ﷺ did not specify. But it's a long time. In that time, what happens is that all creation is dead and all the angels die as well. And the only one that's remaining is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa yabqa wajhu rabbika dhul jalali wal ikram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this duration of 40, He says, لِمَنِ الْمُلْكُ الْيَوْمِ who owns the ultimate kingdom today? And he says this three times. Between each, there's a large, there's an amad, there's a time. Between each time he says it. There's space. And at the end, he says, لِلَّهِ الْوَاحِدِ الْقَهَّارِ It belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At that time, we're all still in the grave. And you're only a tailbone. That's all you are. And at that time, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends rain from the sky, water from the sky. Not the rain that we know of, because the oceans, obviously what happens to them on the day of judgment? They become set ablaze. So there's no water. So where's the water coming from? This water that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends down is ma'ul arsh. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's throne right now is on water. وَكَانَ عَرْشُهُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. It is from that water that will drop onto the earth between the two blows of the trumpet and that's how your body will grow. From that water. Special water. It's water that the arsh is sitting on right now. Your body grows. Your fingertip comes back to how it was. بَلَا قَادِرِينَ عَلَىٰ أَن نُسَوِّيَ بَنَانَةً your personality, your characteristic, your looks, your body, everything is brought back the way it was. And when that is in place, now, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ That yell, that scream, that blow of breath in the second time of the trumpet, all the souls will come out. Now your body is ready. The soul will come out of the trumpet and Allah says, and well, the surah will come with us, وَإِذَا النُّفُوسُ زُوِّجَتْ When the soul will marry its body, زُوِّجَتْ It will find where your body is. Now your body has become a body now. It's been lying there up until the trumpet is blown, up until your soul comes out and it searches for your body and it goes right into your body and you come out of the grave. And then the Prophet ﷺ, he says, I come out and I 
remove whatever dust was on my forehead. In, in other words, this is, this is reality. This is literal stuff. You come out and then you don't know what has happened. And all you're doing is just blowing that, that dirt that's still remaining on you. You know, just like for example, you go to the beach and you sit on the, on the shoreline where the sand is. What do you sit for? One hour, two hours? Then at the end of the day, before sunset, you get up, you want to go. So you get up and you just, you know, and you go back home. This is the same idea. You visited the beach and you sat at the shoreline. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls. He refers to our stay in the grave as a visit. حَتَّى زُرْتُمُ maqabir. Up until you visit the grave. Doesn't mean you go and visit and you come back home. This visit here means up until you sit and you put in your grave. He called the time you stay in your grave, he referred to it as a visit. Why? Because the idea of a visit doesn't sound too long, does it? It doesn't. When you visit someone, it's a visit, it's a short time. So Allah says, up until you visit your grave. When, when the surah comes, we'll explain it in its context. But what I'm referring to is that the time is short. Then at the end you come out and then you just blow off or you wipe off any dirt that's on you. And all of a sudden, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةٌ All it takes one blow. And as a result, فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةٌ As a result, suddenly they're all in a sahira, in a place called a sahira. And this Asahira comes from the word Sahar. Obviously, Sahar, you probably know that means to, to stay awake. You know, you, stay, you say, Sahir to Layl, Sahar to Layl. You know, I stayed awake the whole night. Why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call the Day of Judgment Asahira? Because it's a place in where there's no more sleep. Everyone is Sahir, everyone's Sahran, everyone's awake. There's no sleeping on that day. Many years will pass by on that day and there is no thought of sleep. After that day, there's no such thing as sleep. It's all gone. Whether it's for the people of the paradise or whether it's for the people of the hellfire, the concept of sleep is removed. فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةِ Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala brings a new discussion on hand. And how do we know it's a new discussion? Again, because of the rhyme scheme. هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Before, فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ وَاحِدَةٌ فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةٌ هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى And now this is a story. Something we have to understand in the stories in the Qur'an, inshallah ta'ala, as we move on, we'll explain. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now brings a new subject within the discourse of the surah. And make sure and understand that as we said at the beginning of our lessons, the Qur'an is one unified argument. It's all related. So inshallah ta'ala, we'll describe and we'll explain how this part of the story of Musa is related to the flowing discourse of the surah. Why this part of the surah specifically? Why Musa and Fir'aun? Why not Ibrahim and someone else? Or why not uh, Salih? Or why not Aad? Hud? So many other prophets. So we'll see exactly why. So we said in the beginning of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we saw a few oaths in the beginning of the surah regarding the power of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And we found it especially in regards to the winds. Right? Yeah, remember the, the oath and how we related it to the winds? Now why was it important that Allah Azza wa Jal took an oath by the wind? And by the winds? Because the disbeliever, he used to say, what's this? This afterlife business, you know? Or this whole thing about the unseen punishment and what is he talking about? It all seems and seems and impo impossible. So now the closest thing to the unseen in the seen world is the wind. The closest thing you can experience but you cannot see is the wind. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, 
he illustrates his power of destruction and his mercy by means of wind. So the wind, it comes and it destroys entire towns, just like what Allah did with the people of Ad. And other winds come and they bring along rain and they're a source in which life is sustained. So the idea is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't have to make special arrangements for the kafir or bring some special military or some special angels to bring them to justice and to the punishment. All Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to do is unleash his wind. That's all. That's enough. And they're all destroyed. So whose power are you questioning? This is the idea of the winds because I forgot to reflect and relate back to you the idea of the winds and how it fits in the context of the surah. And that's how it is. They're in, they're in argument amongst one another and they're in total disregard of the hereafter. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He took an oath by the winds, if it's, we're taking by the strong view, which is the winds, not the majority, the strong then this is why Allah Azza wa Jal took the oath by the wind to display and to illustrate His power. It, it's not something big. All it is, it's just wind that I, un, that I unleash and you're all destroyed. And you're all destroyed. Then the second part of the surah was Allah Azza wa Jal described the day of judgment and what happens. Then He described the fear on that day all sorts of warnings, you know. All this was a sort of warning for them. Be careful of what you say, of what you say about the day of judgment. You're not the first people to say this. You're not the first people to deny this. People before you have made fun of the hereafter and look how Allah Azza wa Jal got rid of them with the wind, just like Ad. So be careful. You're not the first ones. Others came before you. Take an example. This will come later on in Surah Al-Fajr where we'll explore it more inshallah ta'ala. Now, why the story of Musa? In the previous Surah, Surah Al-Naba, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to us about a group. And that was لِلطَّاغِينَ مَآبَ For those that rebel against Allah Azza wa Jal's command, He said, that Jahannam كانت مرصادا للطاغين مآبا Jahannam is for those that rebel against Allah Azza wa Jal's command. Now the best example of someone that rebelled against Allah Azza wa Jal's command is Fir'aun. اذهب إلى Fir'aun إنه طغى للطاغين مآبا إنه طغى There's an example of someone that transgressed and passed the limits and rebelled against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, let's see how this flows in the surah. So as the story unfolds, I'll explain to you the relevance that's in, the, in this surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala begins this story, He says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Now Allah azza wa jal is speaking to His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that's obvious by the word kaf. هَلْ أَتَاكَ Did the news of the story of Musa come to you, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So in this verse, Allah azza wa jal, already he's illustrating and depicting his anger at the disbelievers. Now he doesn't speak to them anymore. He's turned his attention away from them. And now he's speaking directly to his messenger. Hal ataka hadithu Musa. And at the same time, the disbeliever is listening. He's listening. So this is serving as a lesson for him. But at the same time, he understands the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala against him. That now Allah is not speaking to them. هَلْ أَتَاكُمْ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى Before Allah was speaking to them. فَإِنَّمَا هِيَ زَجْرَةٌ وَاحِدًا فَإِذَا هُمْ بِالسَّاهِرَةٌ This is all a, a direct warning and an advice to them. Now Allah shifts his attention to the messenger. He says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى And at the same time, Allah now is addressing His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because there is something serious in this surah that should serve as a reminder for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So the word hadith in Arabic refers to something that's huge, something that's enormous, something that's manifest. That's hadith. 
And it also refers to something that is so old that it's forgotten. And when you remind of it, it's new altogether. That's hadith. That's another meaning of hadith. So did the hadith, did the news of Musa reach you? You are going to be reminded of his legacy, Ya Rasulullah. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And, it's, and this, this way Allah is going to speak about the story of Musa. He's going to remind you of his legacy. And it's going to feel as if it's the first time you've heard it in the context of this surah. Now I'll explain how it comes in the context. So Allah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He has spoken and He has narrated this story before in the Qur'an. And now it comes again. Hadith means something that's old, so much so that it's forgotten. When you're reminded of it, it's like new altogether. Now that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning this part of the story of Musa in Surah Al-Nazi'at, which will beautifully flow in the context and in the theme of the surah, it's going to be a whole new vision. Look at this surah from a new perspective, from a new angle. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى So did the news, did the events of Musa come to you? Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what's the story? Allah begins, He says, إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى When His Lord called unto him. Nida, nadahu. Nida in the Arabic language is to call someone out loudly. Nida is to call out loudly. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called out Musa. We find this in Surah Taha. You know, ya Musa. He calls him out by his name. Loudly. Bilwadi al-Muqaddas. In the sanctified valley. You know, in the, in the holy place. Now, Muqaddas, Taqdis, a Taqdis is to speak of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that is appropriate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And to remove from Allah anything or any attribute that is inappropriate of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's Taqdis. Muqaddas is ism makan. It's a place that is specified that is special, specially designed for the declaration of Allah Azza wa Jal's perfection. This is Bilwad al Muqaddasi Tuwa, that's the name of the valley. Now, the story here is in brief. In other places in the Quran, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke this account of Musa, He brings out more detail. You know, when He saw the fire, فَقَالَ لِأَهْلِي He told his family, you people stay here. You know, I'll go up to the fire. I'll see what I can find on the fire. Maybe I can find some news. Maybe some huda, some guidance. I don't know, I'll just go. There's more detail. But here there's no detail. So, what you have to understand is when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala narrates a story, the story itself is not the purpose. That's not the purpose to sit there and be entertained by this story. The very purpose of the story is that, you see, every surah in the Qur'an has a theme, has a discourse. There's a theme that's mentioned in the surah. So the part of the story of the Prophet that's relevant to the discussion of the surah is what's mentioned. So it can help you understand the main idea the main theme of the surah. That's the point. So that's why you'll find part of the surah here, part of the story of Musa. Musa is mentioned 70 times in the Quran. 70 parts are, are mentioned all around in the Quran. The Quran is not a storytelling book. Had that been the case, it all would have been bunched up in one surah. Now, probably you're confused. You'll look at the case of Surah, uh, surah Yusuf alayhi salam. And you'll say, ah, there it is, Surah Yusuf. All of it, perfect, chronological order from beginning to end. What's the purpose of Surah Yusuf then? Is it to be entertained? Is it an actual story? Even then it's not. Surah Yusuf, 
just on the side, just so you can appreciate this yani, from, a, from the, yani, the perspective of the Qur'an. The story of Yusuf, the Surah, Surah Yusuf in the Qur'an, is actually a Surah that came down to counsel the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and it actually refers to his hijrah. And it refers to his life. How this Surah was revealed in Mecca, Am al Huzan. The year of grief, the year of sorrow. And that year is which year in which the Prophet Wasallam's uncle and his wife died. That was the year, Am al Huzan. And this surah was revealed on the Prophet Wasallam on the year. And Surah, al- surah Yusuf is actually talking about the sorrow, the grief of Ya'qub towards his two children. So, O oh Prophet, don't worry, you lost two relatives, that's alright. A Prophet before you, which is Ya'qub, he also lost his two sons and he had to deal with it. You know, learn from his lesson. لَا تَيْأَسُوا مِنْ رَوْحِ اللَّهِ Don't give up in the hope of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yusuf alayhi salam, at one point in his life, he's thrown in where? فِي غَيَابَاتِ الْجُبْ أو فِي غَيَابَةِ الْجُبْ In the dark world. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ends up in a dark cave, which is like the dark world, a dark spot. Then Yusuf alayhi salam, eventually he's taken out and he goes to Egypt. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes out and he goes to Medina. Gives his da'wah there. And that's where he gives his da'wah, Yusuf alayhi salam as well. And then he comes back to establish the legacy of his forefathers. وَاتَّبَعْتُ مِلَّةَ أَبَى إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْحَاقَ وَيَعْقُوبَ and the Prophet ﷺ also comes back to Mecca to establish the legacy of his forefathers and that is the legacy of Ibrahim, Millat Ibrahim. And then also Yusuf ﷺ at the end of the story, when he's joined with his brothers, he says to them, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم No worries. يغفر الله لكم Allah will forgive you. Same words that the Prophet ﷺ says, in Mecca, when he has caught the disbelievers, they're in captivity now. They're in front of him. They say, well, oh, he says to them, what do you think I'm going to do with you? They said, oh, generous and the generous, the brother of the generous and most generous. He says, I will say to you, just like my brother Yusuf said, لا تثريب عليكم اليوم اذهبوا فأنتم الطلقاء. Watch this, the whole story of Surah Yusuf is a reflection of the seerah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. At the end of the surah, Allah says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ صحيح. It has a tafsir, but as well looking at it in the context of the surah, O oh Prophet, this is your path. See, the same path that Yusuf took, this is going to be your path as well. سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ At the beginning of the surah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, لَعَلَّكُمْ تَعْقِلُونَ so you can reflect. Read this story so you can reflect. At the end of the surah, Allah says, Afala ta'qilun. Haven't you now pondered and thought of this? So the story in itself wasn't the point. The point was the, the, the seerah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the lessons that are learned. So now going back to Hal Ataka Hadith Musa, we find this brief account that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala records in Surah Al Nazi'at. And why is this part, why is this story very relevant to the discourse? Let's begin. We say that the first parallel is already found. Remember, O oh Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we called Musa and we gave Musa revelation on the mountain unexpectedly. He didn't expect it. He was just going up there to get a fire to come back to take some warmth from it, seek some warmth from it with his family, or find some guidance because he was lost. He ends up there, and this is a play of words. He says, I might find some guidance. Huda here literally means the guidance of the road. Rather, Allah Azza wa Jal gives him light guidance, the actual guidance, Huda for life. He gives him a book, a Torah. On the mountain, unexpectedly. Now look at the parallel. 
you too, Ya Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We sent Jibreel unexpectedly to you on the mountain of Hira. He was on the mountain of Tua. You're on the mountain of Hira. Ghar Hira. On the mountain of Jabal and Nur, Ghar Hira. And you too were given revelation on that mountain unexpectedly. Now, this is going to be very important for the, for the يعني, continuation of this surah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is reminding the messenger. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did he reveal to Musa on that mountain? You know what he revealed to him? He said to him, هَلْ أَتَاكَ حَدِيثُ مُوسَى إِذْ نَادَاهُ رَبُّهُ بِالْوَادِ الْمُقَدَّسِ طُوَى What did he say? What did he reveal? اِذْهَبْ إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ Go to Fir'aun. اِذْهَبْ إِلَى Now, somewhere else in the Quran, Allah says, فَأْتِيَا فِرْعَوْنَ See, فَأْتِيَا فِرْعَوْنَ means go and approach Fir'aun. اِذْهَبْ إِلَى means go towards Fir'aun and quickly begin with your mission. Don't spend, don't waste time. Go and quickly begin your mission with Fir'aun. اِذْهَبْ إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ Go straight away and get started on the mission. Now the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also, اِذْهَبْ to who? To Quraysh. He's supposed to go to Fir'aun and the Prophet alayhi salatu was salam is supposed to go to Quraysh. Now, why is Musa alayhi salam supposed to go to Fir'aun? Why? إِنَّهُ طَغَى Because he has rebelled. He's transgressed. He's crossed the limit. طَغَى comes from طُغْيَان which means, you know, when you fill the glass the glass cup, you fill it with water, and then it starts flowing on the side, you keep filling, that's tughyan, that's tagha. Inna lamma tagha al When the water flows out of the oceans or whatever, causing flood and so on, that's tughyan. That's its linguistical meaning. But understanding it in the religious sense, you know, the humans, we have set limits. There's limits that are set on the human beings. You can do this, you can't do this. You can say this, you can't say that. When you cross these limits, then you're engaged in Tughya. But it's one thing to break the law out of desperation. You know, you, you break a law, you're desperate. And you feel all bad about it and remorseful and you're worried. That's one thing. And it's another thing to break the law and you're happy about it. And you make fun of it. You know, just like Thamud. Thamud... They slaughtered the camel and they didn't regret slaughtering the camel. They made a fun of it. They started mocking it. So Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودْ بِطَغْوَاهَا So الطُغْيَانِ is when you cross that limit, when you want to do what you want to do and you're happy about it. You don't care. You don't feel remorseful. That's إِنَّهُ طَغَى That's what Fir'aun did. So Fir'aun has done طُغْيَانِ in two ways. Firstly, He's claimed that he's Rabb, that will come in the surah, and Rabbukum al-A'la, and he's enslaved Bani Israel. And he doesn't care about it. And this is his Tughyan. So Musa alayhi salam has to go to Fir'aun because he's rebelled. He's transgressed. He's crossed the limit. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam also has to go to Quraysh. Why? Because they've taha as well. They crossed the limit. They've crossed the boundary. They've transgressed. Now this teaches us something important. What's illustrated is that the problem with Quffar Quraysh wasn't that they didn't believe in the hereafter. That wasn't their problem. The real problem is that they loved transgressing and rebelling against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. They didn't want to be, they didn't want any, any limit to be put on them. They don't want to be told what to do. Do this, do that, say this, say that. They don't want this. They want to live this free lifestyle. You know, carefree lifestyle. That's what they wanted to live. That was their crime. And Fir'aun, that was his crime as well. So now you're going to see the parallel. Fir'aun, it doesn't mean he says, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la made him worse. 
It's the idea that he rebelled, that he transgressed. And Kuffar Quraysh as well, the idea that they transgressed and they rebelled. This all puts him in one category. So now you can go along with the story and you'll understand. So this is a reminder also for us. Don't think that you need to say, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la, so you can be the worst of creation. Fir'aun, he has his own special thing on the Day of Judgment. But also it refers and it's a reminder for us. Anyone, anyone that believes he can have freedom and do whatever he wants and say whatever he wants, then he's a taghi. He taghi. His only final abode should be إِنَّ جَهَنَّمَ كَانَتْ مِرْصَادًا لِلطَّاغِينَ مَا أَبَى That's for anyone that taghi. Not only special for Quraysh and for Fir'aun. You'll see now in the, in the story as it keeps going. فَنَاو إِذْهَبْ إِلَى فِرْعَوْنَ إِنَّهُ طَغَى O Musa, head towards Fir'aun, straight away start on your mission. Verily, certainly, he has rebelled. It's time you go and give him advice. فَقُلْ Now what, what are you going to say to him? It is very, very carefully chosen words. Subhanallah, watch this. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّ these amazing words. Do you have any inclination whatsoever inside of you at all that wants to cleanse yourself of the evil and filth you're involved in? This is the question. Musa alayhi salam is told to go to Fir'aun and say to him, Fir'aun, do you have any voice of reason, anything in your conscience? Is there any good in you that tells you you need to purify yourself? That tells you you should be a better person? The mission of the prophets and the messengers was Part of the mission of the messengers was the concept of tazkiyah. Tazkiyah, that was one of the core components of the work of the messenger. And tazkiyah, what it translates to is purification. It's a purification. And it actually means to take the elements of one's personality that are evil, that are rebellious, and to cleanse oneself from it. What's a wicked and an evil personality within you? To put it aside, clean it. This is Tazkir. So the question that Musa asks Fir'aun is the same question that should be directed to those that do not fear the Day of Judgment. It's the same question that's directed to Quraysh, to the people of the Prophet So the real question is, do you find any voice of reason, any conscience deep inside of yourself that tells you you should become a better person? If that's the case, if there's a little voice, if there's something very small within you that tells you, man, you should be a good person, then there is hope for you. But if there is no voice within you, and that's all gone, then there's nothing left inside of you, then what is it called? What should be done? I should make this da'wah to you. And, and this is the da'wah, this is the question. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن تَزَكَّ When he comes and gives him da'wah, he doesn't order him. He doesn't say, oh, you better watch out what you're doing and you got to stop and this is Allah and worship him. No, why isn't he doing this with Fir'aun? Because Fir'aun is saying, أَنَا رَبُّكُمْ الْأَعْلَىٰ If he believes he is the Lord, means there's nothing above him. So how can Musa come in and order him? Tell him, fear Allah and worship Allah. No, he doesn't say this. Because if he commands him, then Fir'aun is going to say, "What? how is this man commanding me when I own all commandments? I am Rabbukum. So look at the wisdom. He comes in a way where he speaks to him in a form of a question. هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن So the word implies, do you have any good, any desire of good left in you that you want to bring it out? And he doesn't say to him, 
is there any good in you? No, because of course Allah Azza wa Jal created man and there is good in him. He created good in man. That's the fitrah, the predisposed human decency. Everyone has good in him. Rather, what he's asking, he's saying that this good within you, is there any inclination? Would you like to bring this out? Would you like to, come, would you like to be a better person? In other words, that's what he's saying. فَقُلْ هَلْ لَكَ إِلَىٰ أَن Then he says to him, you know, this is the last resort. If you've given someone da'wah, you know, uh, the Qur'an, you recite to him Qur'an, the message in itself is probably profound. It is. The Qur'an, there's all good in it. But when someone reaches this level of rebellion, you cannot now assume that the Qur'an is going to do the work for it. There has to be some sort of good within him that clicks with the good that comes from outside. And that's the, the interpretation of nurun ala nur. Light upon light, meaning the light of revelation upon the light of whatever good is left within you. At the end, that's all it resorts to. You finished, you've given him the da'wah, you've told him the Qur'an, that hasn't done nothing to him. Musa alayhi salam, he's showed Fir'aun everything that hasn't done nothing to him. Now, the only thing that's left is that he asks him this question. If there is good in you, then let your conscience be the better judge. Let, let your conscience judge. If there is good, it comes out. If there isn't, then there's no use of it. And shall I guide you to your Lord? You know, al hidayah ila, this preposition ila too means by knowledge. Because you know, in Surah Al Fatiha, we recite, we say, Ihdina sirata. Ihdina sirata al mustaqim. And that, a very, or a rough translation for it would be, guide us to and along the straight path. Because there was no preposition. We didn't say, Ihdina ila sirata al mustaqim. When you drop the preposition, this is what it gives of meaning. Guide us to and along the straight path. When we say guide us to the straight path, we mean give us the knowledge. And along means support us, be with us. Give us the knowledge and support us along this straight path. But when Fir'aun, when Musa السلام, says, وَأَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ And shall I guide you to your Lord? Not along, because alongside is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even, even these minute details are recorded in the Qur'an. إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ Shall I guide you to your Lord with knowledge? In other words, Musa alayhi salam can teach him, can give him knowledge. فَتَخْشَ And as a result, if I was to give you this knowledge, what should automatically happen to you is فَتَخْشَ That you should fear. And الْخَشَّ تَخْشَ is fear of something that's huge, something that's more powerful than you. And this word is used here because Fir'aun is thinking he's powerful. So Allah says, فَتَخْشَ And تَخْشَ means that you fear something bigger than you. So in other words, Fir'aun is being taught that this is something greater than you. And if you listen to Musa, then what he's going to recite and read to you is something that should move this goodness within you, bring it out. And as a result, فَتَخْشَ You'll fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this teaches us that true knowledge, أَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ That gives you the meaning of the knowledge, it eventually leads to what? To true khashya. أَهْدِيَكَ إِلَىٰ رَبِّكَ If you're given true knowledge, real knowledge, that should send you all the way and lead you all the way to فَتَخْشَ To the guidance. Now, when Musa alayhi salam, you see there's something that we learn here. Uh, this is how he implements Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saying of فَقُولَ لَهُ قَوْلًا لَيِّنًا Allah tells Musa when you go to Fir'aun, tell him a soft, calm speech. Don't be rough and hard on him. And so this was calm and soft. It's in a question form. And what it teaches you is that when you advise someone Make sure your advice to someone is on the same level as well. Why? Because there was a story that's mentioned once a person, he came to the king and he said, O oh, king, I want to advise you 
But I want to be really harsh with my advice towards you. He says, I don't accept. He says, why? He says, you're not better than Musa, and I'm not worse than Fir'aun. Why are you coming to me in this harsh manner? And this is Musa, Musa alayhi salam, the best of creation at that time, with the worst of creation at that time, Fir'aun, and look how he's told to, to address him. Layyina, layyina, you know, layyina is, is the, the date, you know, when it's flexible, it moves the date, the soft date, that's layyina. Be consistently calm and gentle in your speech the whole way. And subhanAllah, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, you find this. You read the discussion and the dialogue that happens between Musa and Fir'aun there. Fir'aun is really, not he's up there, you know, with his harsh manner and his harsh words. You know, أَجْمَعِينَ and he's very soft and very calm during his whole يعني, uh, dialogue with him. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى And at the same time, keep in mind that the narrative of Fir'aun is being mentioned, but really this is a parallel to the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Quraysh, the disbelievers. This is how the messenger should address Quraysh. And this is how he's addressing it, because he's reading this verse and they're listening. They're listening to this. This is Then as a result, in order to make him find this goodness within him, Allah Azza wa Jal help. He's, he's helping Fir'aun to find this goodness within him. What did he do? He helped him. He showed him the ultimate sign. The biggest sign. And that was the snake. Maybe that could bring and instigate that good within him and it should come out. فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى This is the ultimate, the great sign. Prophet Musa alayhi salam, he showed Fir'aun the biggest signs. He showed him a lot of signs. And Fir'aun was scared of all the signs. And the one he feared the most was the staff, was the stick when it turned into a serpent, into a large python, a snake. And how do we know that he feared that the most? Is because later on, when he called upon his magicians, the only thing they competed Musa was the, the idea of the staff. You know, Yalla, bring your rods and bring your ropes and throw them and make them snakes. That was the only thing he faced. He didn't bother to face when he pulled out his hand and it became clear, bright light, you know or the locust that came uh, in a group as a form of punishment, that didn't bother. The one he was scared the most of was that the stick, was that the staff turned into a serpent. فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى He showed him the biggest sign. The biggest sign was that real snake. The parallel here is that Allah Azza wa Jal showed Fir'aun the big sign and he showed Quraysh the ayat al-kubra as well, which was what? Which was? Who knows? What's the big sign for Quraysh? No. What's the biggest sign for Quraysh? The Quran in itself. The Quran in itself, with its eloquence, with its power. So much so, that when they used to confront the Prophet wasallam, they couldn't even speak a word. They wanted to stop him, they couldn't. The power of the word that came out of the Prophet's, Prophet Prophet's mouth. Just imagine this. One of them would come, he'd listen to the Quran, he'd go back to his people. What happened to you? Your face has changed. What do you mean? Now that's normal because it's the Quran. It's the power. One of them would come past, he'd listen to the Prophet recite, Am khuliqu min ghayri shay'in am humul khaliqun. Were they created out of nothing? Or did they create themselves? Then he said, my heart almost flew out of my chest. How powerful is this word? This is Al-Ayat Al-Kubra. This is the biggest sign for Quraysh. Because they said, they assumed they were the most eloquent. So much so, that when they used to speak to one another, they'd only speak through poetry. That's how eloquent they were. 
So he comes the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam claiming that this book is the most eloquent. So they gave it ever extra attention. Let's find a mistake. He's saying it's eloquent. They couldn't. They meet up together and they say, what are we going to say? Let's say he's a liar. Someone will say, no, you. Why don't you say he's a liar? Everyone knows he's truthful. They're going to think of you as, as a shocker. You know? Think of something else. Ya Allah, what's another thing? Ya Allah, he's not trustworthy. Or he's a magician. Or he's this. He, or every time they come up with something, it only brings them into more uh, distress. They didn't want the Quran to manifest as it did. And that was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sign to them. فَأَرَاهُ الْآيَةَ الْكُبْرَى Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى What did Fir'aun do? He كَذَّبَ وَعَصَى He lied against. You see, when you say كَذَّبَ, you'll say كَذَّبَ بِي He lied against something you mentioned. But Allah doesn't say what he lied against. كَذَّبَ بِمُوسَى كَذَّبَ بِآيَاتِنَا He doesn't mention كَذَّبَ That's it. So what does this imply? It implies he lied in everything. He lied and he belied against the message, against Allah, against Musa, against the miracles, against his conscience, against everything. فَكَذَّبَ So the simple saying كَذَّبَ So simply saying كَذَّبَ would mean that he belied. It covers lying against everything of the truth. And he had no reason to lie against the truth except for the fact that he was arrogant and there was no goodness left in him. Wa'asa, and he disobeyed, he refused. And asa is to refuse and disobey even though you know something is good for you. So in other words, Fir'aun knew what is true. But now the fact that he is tughyan, he the fact that he is arrogant, that's it. He cannot accept for this truth. And this is the same thing with Fir'aun, uh, with Quraysh. They knew the Qur'an is right. They knew the Qur'an is, is straight speech. Up until one of them said, إِنَّهُ لَيَكُونُ شَأْنٌ عَظِيمٌ Oh, verily, what that messenger is saying, it is truly going to be something great. They acknowledge this true. You know, Al-Walid bin Mughira, he also says, man, this word is not the word of a bashar. So what stopped you? What stopped you? Nothing but arrogance. That's all. Nothing but tughyat. فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى Inshallah, I'll just finish the أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى فَحَشَرَ فَنَادَى The ending of the surah, inshallah, for the, the story of uh, Musa. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, oh, sorry, the, just the parallel, فَكَذَّبَ وَعَصَى is that Fir'aun, he lied against the signs, and Quraysh also lied against everything as well. They lied against the messenger, against the Qur'an, against the day of judgment, against the message, against everything. Just like Fir'aun. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى Now, what did Fir'aun do? He أَدْبَرَ يَسْعَى He turned away. That's أَدْبَر. And يَسْعَى He was pacing back and forth. Because now, after he saw Al-Ayat Al-Kubra, he saw the major and the biggest sign not only him, all everyone saw it. And everyone was pretty impressed. Like, well, maybe this is right. And so much so, that even the magicians fell into prostration. And they believed in Musa. And Rabbi Musa wa Harun. They had belief now. And this was bringing Fir'aun's message down and his authority down. It was threatening his kingdom. It was just dropping, his work was dropping. And adbara, you know, at the beginning of the surah, fal mudabbirati amra, here, thumma adbara, what's the difference? Mudabbirat comes from tadbir. We said tadbir is to plan something very deeply and very carefully. But adbara comes from idbar, which means to plan something quickly without much thought. So that's what Fir'aun was doing. Now, he doesn't have much time in front of him. He's, yes'a, he's pacing. Back and forth, he's walking back and forth. What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? He's seeing everyone now becoming believers. And he's thinking, he's quickly planning. And his plan, he's not even giving it full attention because probably he's fearing that he's losing power. What is he going to do? He's going up and down now. <coughs> and uh, so the ideas that he'll bring up, what, is, what am I going to say to the people? 
he's majnoon, or should I prison him? Anyway, that doesn't work with him. Later on, what does he say? He says, إِنَّهُ لَكَبِيرُكُمُ الَّذِي عَلَّمَكُمُ السِّحْرِ He goes, aha, I found it. This is what I'm going to say. This one, Musa, he's the biggest magician. He's the one that taught you the magic. فَلَا أُقَطِّعَنَّ أَيْدِيَكُمْ وَأَرْجُلَكُمْ مِنْ خِلَافِ this is what I'm going to do to them. I'm going to chop off their arms and legs from opposite sides, meaning chop this and chop this leg, chop the left hand and the right leg, and I'm going to crucify them. On the trunk of the palm tree. That's what I'm going to do. And they will serve as an example for anyone that wants to follow them. That was his final decision. That was his tadbir. That's what he planned. He's, he was running out of ideas and his claims every time sounded more stupid. You know? And this is exactly what happens when the truth hits the falsehood. There's no more escape. You want to think of this, you think of this, you think of that, it doesn't work. Look how it works against you. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, now look what he does. He plans to do this. Then if hashara fanada, Allah says, hashara fanada. He gathered the people. The word hashar is used when you gather animals. You know, Allah says, وَإِذَا الْوَحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ When the animals, when the beasts are gathered, this hashara, jama'a is what you use for people. Jama'atu nas I gathered the people. Hashartu nas you don't say hashartu nas You hashart the animals. That's the hashar is for the animals. In other words, what we're being, is what's illustrated in the verse, is that now he's so angry at what's happening outside, he gathered them like animals, forcefully. He brought them all one bunch. Why? Because everyone is giving a thought to this message. Man, Musa and what he's bringing out is very convincing. And Fir'aun hasn't made a comment yet. Maybe he's defeated. Maybe that's the truth. Oh, and by the way, the, the, the magicians are making sujood. That's got to be it. That's Musa. So he's really upset. So he brings them all forcefully. And he brings them all like animals. Fahashara, fanada. Remember, we said if nadahu it means to yell, to yell out. Now he screams out at the top of his lungs. This is now the official address of the state. This is the official address of the government. Comes out. What does he say? Fakala ana rabbukum al-a'la. Allahu Akbar. See what he said. Fakala. This is fakal here, meaning he said. He said strongly, ana rabbukum. Al-A'la. Why would he say this? Now everyone in Egypt had no choice except to believe his Rabbukum Al-A'la. So why is he saying it again? Because he is losing power. He has to re-solidify the ID and reintroduce the ID that listen, I'm Rabbukum Al-A'la. And he doesn't say Ana Rabbukum and he stops there. He says Adz Al-A'la as well. I'm the Supreme Lord. You know? What kind of tughyan is this? What kind of tagha is this? This is manifest. This is shown in Fir'aun. Ana rabbukum al-a'la. And so, how does this relate? That was his tughyan. That was his rebellion against Allah. That he called himself tagha. That he called himself, sorry, rabbukum al-a'la. He made, he, he, this is shirk. This is a form of shirk. What was the shirk of Quraysh? was that they kept clinging onto the worship, onto the idol worshipping tradition of their forefathers. So the shirk that Fir'aun committed was that he said, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la. The shirk that Kuffar Quraysh are committing is that they're clinging onto the idol worshipping tradition of their forefathers. Similar. This is a similar story. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes the story of Musa and Fir'aun in this uh, surah. He says, فَأَخَذَهُ اللَّهُ نَكَالَ الْآخِرَةِ وَالْأُولَى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him. فَأَخَذَهُ He seized him. Nakala. Nakal is a, a, it's a, like a bracelet, an ankle. It's that's put on the ankle. It's tied on the foot. And it is connected to a chain that's tied against the wall. They use this in the prison. Why do they use it? So the, prison can't, so the prisoner cannot escape. Something that's strapped around your leg, and there's a long chain that pushes, that's it's strapped onto the wall. 
it's all done, it's done today in prisons, in old prisons, in modern prisons, so that the prisoner cannot escape. In other words, what's being depicted is that Allah took him in a way he couldn't escape. There was no escape for him. Wherever he wanted to escape, there was no, that's where he was going to die. That was how Allah, how he seized him and he took him. But he took him nakal al-akhirati wal He took him for his akhirah, for his later, wal and his earlier crime. What does this refer to? al akhirata refers to his later crime, which was saying, Ana rabbukum al-a'la. Allah took him for that one. That was the last thing he said before he got destroyed. Rabbukum al-a'la. What's al-ula? The ula was before he said, Ma alimtu lakum min ilahin ghayri. He said, I don't know. He looked at his people. He goes, I don't know of a Lord other than me. Ma alimtu lakum min ilahin ghayri. Now, saying that is easier than saying, I am Rabbukum al-a'la. So that's al-akhirah. He got destroyed and punished for saying, Ana Rabbukum al-a'la. And al-ula is because he said, I don't know of a Lord other than me. Then another meaning will say, Nakal al-akhirah means that on the day of judgment, he receives punishment. Udkhulu ala fir'awna ashadd al-athab. On the day of judgment, they will receive the worst form of punishment. And al-ula, meaning in their grave, al-naru yu'raduna alayha ghuduwan wa ashiyya. Allah Azza wa Jal says that they'll be burning in the fire day and night. And this is referring to the punishment of the grave. So that's the punishment of the grave. It's coming onto them day and night. Now, this is al-ula and al-akhirah later on in the fire, in the punishment. And there's one more thing that we, we learn from this surah and this story. There's some irony in here. You know before how we said, what did Fir'aun want to do? His idea was, let me chop off their arms and legs from opposite sides and crucify them onto the trunk of the palm tree and let them be an example for those that follow them. Look at the irony. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what did He do with him? He took him, He made him drown and made him an example for others. And another thing, subhanallah, and this is, I realized just when I was in my trip in Egypt, uh, Somewhere else in the Qur'an, in Surah Al-Zukhruf, there's another big claim that Fir'aun makes. He says, وَنَادَى فِرْعَوْنُ فِي قَوْمِهِ He yells out to his people and he says, أَلَيْسَ لِي مُلْكُ مِصْرِ Don't I own the full kingdom of Egypt? وَهَذِهِ الْأَنْهَارُ تَجْرِي مِنْ تَحْتِي And look at these rivers that flow beneath me. أَفَلَا تُبْصِرُونَ Don't you see? Look at the irony. When I went, I never knew, we went to visit, or well not visit, we went to just go see where Fir'aun was. And the amazing thing is that his grave, or sorry, not his grave, where his tomb, his body, is, this is the ocean, Nahr Nil, that's the Nile River is here. And his body is below the Nile River. So before he's saying that the Nile River flows beneath me, now the Nile River is flowing above him. And he's below. There's another irony in what he said. For Allah Azza wa Jal did make him as an example. So you can be an example for those that come after you. So the warning is also here. This is for Quraysh. The warning is for Quraysh. Look, he has made an example out of someone that was much powerful and that was more wealthier and more powerful than you in the past. And if you still make jokes against the messenger against this day, then very easy. Well, there was someone that was much more stronger than you and I took. Very easy to take you. And at the same time, this verse serves, serves as a comfort for the Prophet wasallam. It's like he's being told, don't worry about the disbelievers. If they persist in their evil, then they're going to face the same fate as Fir'aun. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concludes, says, إِنَّ فِي ذَلِكَ لَعِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Indeed, in that, in the story, in the account of Musa and Fir'aun, لَعِبْرَةً لِمَنْ يَخْشَى Ibra is commonly translated as it's a lesson or it's a warning. This story should serve as a lesson and a warning. But rather, Ibra comes from the word عُبُور. You know, عَبَرَ النَّهَرَ 
It means to cross a river, cross the river, water, cross the river. And also they used to say, عبرت العين. عبرت العين means when the T crossed the line of the eye and came out of the eye. When the T came out of the eye. عبرت العين. And how does this fit perfectly in this verse? Allah is saying, إن في ذلك لعبرة. In this account, especially in this account, there is a reason to cry. There is a reason to cry. La'ibratan. And there is a reason as well that you should cross from disbelief to belief. This is la'ibratan, abar al nahar, to cross the river. Cross the river from disbelief to belief. And let this story share it will be as a reminder so much so that it should move you to tears. La'ibratan for who but? Liman yakhsha. For those that fee something that's more powerful than them. La'ibratan liman yakhsha. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, that's what he concludes the story. In nafi dhalika la'ibratan liman yakhsha. This is a ibra will make them cry and it should make them enter the truth of Islam if they fee that which is greater than them. But remember, if you are too arrogant and think you're so big, then remember the fate of Fir'aun. And remember the sky, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also created. It is a bigger creation than you, and it obeys Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. أَأَنْتُمْ أَشَدُّ خَلْقًا أَمِ السَّمَاءُ بَنَاهَا We'll leave that discussion, inshaAllah ta'ala, for next week. Uh, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He makes us people of the Qur'an, that He makes us people that benefit from the reminders of the Qur'an. إنه وليه ذلك والقادر عليه وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين